Hey, what's up, Stock Compounders? Brad here. So Peter Kaufman gave a talk almost four years ago on the multidisciplinary approach to thinking. Uh, and this is honestly the only talk I've been able to find from Peter Kaufman. It seems like everything else he's done has been private, hasn't been published on the internet. So this was a real treat to really just get inside the mind of Peter Kaufman. If you've never heard of Peter Kaufman, uh, he edited Poor Charlie's Almanac, okay, which is one of the greatest investing books of all time. Uh, he's also on the board of Daily Journal with Charlie Munger. Um, so he's had a lot of exposure to Charlie Munger and clearly uh, looking at the title of this talk, The Multidisciplinary Approach to Thinking, Charlie Munger had a huge influence on Peter Kaufman in kind of taking this initiative to develop this multidisciplinary thinking. Um, so I want to share some highlights that I have from this talk to help them sink in a little bit deeper. I have listened to this talk more than I care to admit. Uh, it's, it's one of the shifts I'm making in 2022. If I hear a great talk, if I come across a great book, um, you know, my, my approach is more and more towards going deep into content that really resonates rather than just trying to add as many books to my, my checked off list as I can. So uh, this is a talk well worth going deep on. So uh, this is going to be two parts. I'm going to do the first part here, cover about half of this talk. Uh, and then I'll probably do a follow-up video covering the other half. So let's get into it. The multidisciplinary approach to thinking. Why is it important to be a multidisciplinary thinker, right? Uh, to understand is to know what to do, okay? It's a very powerful line from Ludwig Wittgenstein. Um, how many mistakes do you make when you understand something, right? Mistakes come from lack of understanding. They come from blind spots. So the issue with understanding, and this is a, a Japanese proverb, a frog in a well knows nothing of the mighty ocean, okay? So we live in these complex systems, right? Life is composed of, of many complex systems. So if all we know is, is kind of one well, right? We're a frog in one well. If we understand one specialty really well, uh, we're like a one-legged man in an ass-kicking contest, okay? Uh, as Charlie Munger would say, you know, to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? So that's why it's really important to know the big ideas across multiple disciplines, okay? Because you know, how are we going to make intelligent decisions if, you know, all, all we know is kind of one of those wells? Uh, we can't. We've really got to know the big ideas across multiple disciplines. So, you know, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. It makes more sense to me after hearing this talk from Peter Kaufman than it did before. Um, so Peter tried to learn what Munger calls the big ideas from all the different disciplines. Now, Peter took a shortcut, okay? And he says, you know, if you try to do it the way Charlie Munger did it, you don't have enough time in your lifetime, right? These, these subjects are too big. It, it's, the, books, the books are too long. You, you just can't, can't do it uh, in your lifetime. So what Peter Kaufman did is he found this magazine called Discover magazine. And he saw that every issue, these are monthly issues of Discover Magazine, in every issue there was like a six to seven page interview with some expert in some field of science. Okay. And, you know, say, say one of the article, articles is about nanoparticles. So you've got this expert in nanoparticles uh, talking in layperson's terms right? And they're trying to get all of their big ideas across in this interview, right? They have one shot to kind of tell the world why nanoparticles are, are such a game changer. 
So, you know, it's easy to read. It's in layperson's terms. You get all the big ideas. And so, you know, Peter Kaufman saw this as a sort of a concise, efficient way to uncover all of these big ideas from many different fields of science. And so what he did is he, you know, got, got a subscription to Discover Magazine, went through the archives. He saw that there were 12 years of Discover Magazines available online in the archives. So he printed off 12 years of these interviews, one interview each month. That's 144 interviews. And, you know, he printed them off, put them in three different binders. And every morning he would go to the coffee shop and he would read for an hour or two through these interviews. And he would read through them index fund style, which means he read them all, right? He didn't pick and choose. He said if he were to pick and choose, he probably would have read 14 out of these 144 interviews. But he read them all. And what did he have after six months? He had inside his head every single big idea from every single domain of science. Okay, It only took him six months. And it wasn't that hard because it was written in layperson's terms. And just like an index fund, he captured all the parabolic ideas, right? That nobody else has all, all the parabolic mental models that nobody else has. Cause who's going to read six to seven pages on nanoparticles, right? And that's actually where he got some of his best ideas. So, you know, I really appreciate uh, this approach um, that Peter Kaufman took to really develop this framework of multidisciplinary thinking to capture these models that nobody else had. Um, and of course, you know, he'd be reading through these articles, he'd see in some arcane aspect of science, oh my gosh, this is exactly how this works over here in biology or in human behavior, right? So you start to see, Charlie Munger called it a lattice work of mental models. Um, and part of that lattice work is that a lot of these models connect to each other in specific ways. And when you get when you get models that connect to a bunch of other models, that's incredibly powerful, right? Because that gives you an insight into how the world works uh, that holds in many different situations, right? In many different disciplines. And Peter Kaufman gets into a few of those models that really span uh, multiple different disciplines uh, and are incredibly powerful. So, um, right, you have to know all these big ideas if, if you're going to make good decisions in life. There's really no way around it. Uh, so how he uses ideas that no one else in the world has, and yet he can be comfortable that they're right, okay? Now, this is where he gets into his three buckets frameworks. He says, a statistician's best friend is a large, relevant sample size, okay? Because if you have a large and relevant sample size, you can't be wrong. The only way you can be wrong is if the sample size isn't large enough or the data isn't relevant. So he's got three different buckets uh, comprising large relevant sample sizes, right, to our lives. The first bucket is 13.7 billion years of the inorganic universe, right? It's essentially everything since the Big Bang. Okay, it's the inorganic universe. Uh, and we live in it, right? So it's a, a very large sample size, the biggest sample size we have. And it's relevant, right? Because we live in it. It's physics. It's geology. It's anything not living. Okay, that's the first bucket. Second bucket, 3.5 billion years, which is biology on planet Earth. Okay, we, we're part of that, right? So it's relevant. It's large. 3.5 billion years of life on Earth. Uh, and bucket number three is 20,000 years of recorded human history. Okay, that's our story. That's the most relevant. 
So you get these three different buckets. Now, if we can find models that apply in all three of those buckets, you know, that's like, that's like a slot machine where you get all three slots lining up, right? You've hit the jackpot. So uh, Peter's going to give a few examples that really line up in all three of those buckets. So the first one, uh, is there a simple two-word description that accurately describes how everything in the world works, right? Wouldn't that be useful if in two words we could describe how everything in the world works? Uh, it turns out there is two words that does that. Uh, in bucket one, we look at physics, right? What is Newton's third law of motion? For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction, okay? You know, if you push down on the table, you know, X with, with X force, it pushes back with X force, okay? That's reciprocation, right? Equal and opposite reaction, reciprocation. Now, not only is it reciprocation, it's perfectly mirrored reciprocation. So you push a certain, with a certain force, pushes back, same, same amount. So uh, mirrored reciprocation applies to bucket one, right? It applies to physics. Bucket two, you look at biology, and here he gives an example of, you know, picking a cat up by its tail. And I forget who said it, but, you know, some, somebody's famous quote was, um, if you pick up a cat by its tail, you'll learn a lesson you can learn in no other way, right? So the whole idea here is if, if you treat a cat, a certain, you know, uh, in a way that it doesn't find agreeable, it's going to reciprocate that, right? It's going to try to scratch you. Now, if you start swinging the cat by its tail, you've escalated the situation. Now, the cat is going to try to gouge your eyes out, right? It's going to escalate the situation as well. So you've got that mirrored reciprocation. And he goes on to say, uh, your entire life, every interaction you've had with another human being is merely mirrored reciprocation. Okay, think about that. That is an incredibly powerful statement. Now, it's not going to be true 100% of the time. Sometimes you're going to come across people, you're in a good mood, they're not, right? But the vast majority of the time, and Peter Kaufman says it's about 98% of the time, at least in California. And he uses uh, his elevator example, okay? And the example is you walk into an elevator, there's a stranger, a, a, soul, a soul stranger in the elevator, and you have three different options for how to react when you enter this elevator with this stranger. The first is you smile and say good morning, okay? And Peter says 98% of the time, that person is going to smile back and say good morning, right? They're going to mirror. They're going to reciprocate uh, exactly how you um, interact with them. Second uh, option is you can scowl and, and hiss when you enter the elevator. And 98% of the time, they might not hiss back at you, but they will scowl, okay? And you can imagine, you know, that, that's not hard to envision that kind of scenario. Now, somebody scowls at you, it's kind of instinctual to scowl back. Uh, the third option is to do nothing, right? And personally, that's, that's what I, I'm embarrassed to say. That's what I do most of the time. When I enter the eleva an elevator, there's a stranger. You know, I don't do anything. Okay? I just kind of mind my own business. And of course, what do you get back the vast majority of the time? Nothing, right? Nothing. Uh, so that is mirrored reciprocation. Okay? It applies to all three of those buckets, physics, biology, human, human behavior. Uh, you think we can bank on that? You know, being that it's in all three of those buckets, absolutely, we can bank on that. Uh, so you think, well, that seems too simple, right? Well, it is simple, but it's very sophisticated, right? We've, we've derived that model from three different buckets, right? The three largest relevant sample sizes uh, for us humans, right? You've got the inorganic universe. You've got 
uh, the organic universe, biology on planet Earth, and you have human behavior going back 20,000 years. Okay, Mirrored reciprocation applies to all of those. Um, so most people think if something's complex, it must be sophisticated. Okay, They think those go hand in hand. The more complex something is, the more sophisticated it must be. Now, it's if you think that, you know, if you if you think along those lines, it's very important to understand what Albert Einstein uh, said about the five ascending levels of cognitive prowess. Okay. Now, the the fifth rung is smart. Okay, that's the kind of the lowest level of cognitive prowess, smart. Fourth, you have intelligent, okay? Third, you have brilliant. Second, you have genius, okay? I can't be right. Genius is second? What could possibly be above genius? Uh, well, there is something above genius. It's simple, okay? And why is simple higher than genius in terms of cognitive prowess? Well, it's because you can understand it, okay? You know, a lot of geniuses, right? You, you kind of know genius a lot of times when you see it. But if you can't understand it, it it's not the highest level. It, it can't be, right? The highest level would be something that's incredibly insightful, that's easily understood by everyone, okay? So that's the highest, simple. And clearly we've derived a very simple model here, mirrored reciprocation. Um, so let's, let's give another example of a multidisciplinary model that is just about as pure of an economics model as you can find. This talk was given, given at the Cal Poly Pomona Economics Club. Okay, So this is great. Um, it relates to what I named my YouTube channel after. So Peter asks, what's the most powerful force that we as human beings, both as individuals and as groups, can potentially harness towards achieving our ends in life? Okay, that's a very intriguing idea. Well, Albert Einstein was quoted saying, the most powerful force in the universe is compound interest. Okay. That's not all he said about compound interest. It's the greatest mathematical discovery of all time. It's the eighth wonder of the world. And those who understand it get paid by it. And those who don't pay for it. Okay. So let's bring compound interest back to these three different buckets. Okay. D does it fit in these buckets? So what's a good work, working definition of compound interest? Peter Kaufman would say a good working definition of compound interest is dogged, incremental, constant progress over a very long time frame. Okay. Um, so, you know, Albert Einstein covered bucket number one. That's kind of, you know, how, how the universe has unfolded. Sort of this constant, dogged, incremental progress over a very long time frame. Now, the second bucket is biology, right? Is there anything in biology that fits this definition of dogged, incremental, constant progress over a very long time frame? Absolutely. Evolution, right? Charles Darwin. Uh, the machine of evolution, okay? fits perfectly. That, that's how evolution works. Incremental, dogged, constant progress over a very long time frame. Uh, the problem that human beings have, right, is that we don't like to be constant, okay? Even though we know if we want to achieve great things, you look at Berkshire Hathaway with Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, how do they build Berkshire Hathaway, right? It was dogged, constant, incremental, progress over a very long time frame. That's how they did it. They were constant. Okay? They, didn't, they didn't take breaks. They weren't intermittent. Um, 
that's a problem human beings have, right? We, we don't like to be constant. We like to kind of push the boulder up halfway up the hill and say, yeah, we'll come back to it later, right? Boulder falls back down. Um, so this intermittency is a huge problem, right? We're the functional equivalent of Sisyphus pushing his boulder halfway up the mountain. This is the human condition. There's a geometric term for this. It's called variance drain. Whenever you interrupt the constant increase above a certain threshold, you lose compounding. You're no longer on the log curve. You fall back onto a linear curve or even worse, a step down curve. Okay. This is incredibly important um, because as those of us know who've studied compounding, uh, I mean, the, the, the results are exponential over time, right? You look at Warren Buffett's wealth, for example, um, and that curve, it's just that hockey stick curve. And you don't get that unless you're constant. And it's hard to be constant, right? It's kind of against our nature. Um, I think uh, the reason Buffett and Munger were able to be constant were that they really designed their life in a way that they're excited to show up, right? They found the thing that really gets them excited to get out of bed in the morning. Um, uh, you know, I think that's a big piece of the puzzle for humans to be constant and incremental and dogged over a long period of time. So just find that thing that really lights you up. Um, let me give an example of why intermittency is perhaps the most important thing in your life, whether you realize it or not. Okay. So an example about the hazards of intermittency, not being constant. So the example is you bring a puppy home for the first time, right? And you know, what, what's, what's your objective? bringing this puppy home. Peter would say, you want to have an engaged, contributing, all-in new member of your household. Now, day one, how's that going, right? Not well. It's going terribly. The puppy is shaken like a leaf in the corner. Uh, it is anything but an all-in member of the household. Now, human beings are really good at solving this problem, okay? They know we need to provide uh, a safe, nurturing environment for the puppy. We need to feed the puppy consistently, give it water, uh, speak in soothing tones. We are really good at this. Uh, and if we do that, if we do that consistently, in about a week, that puppy will go all in. Okay? It'll attach itself to us, and it will be willing to die for us. All right? We will have an engaged, all-in, contributing member of the household after one week of being constant, being consistent. Um, now, the puppy didn't go all-in because it was our idea, right, to have this engaged, all-in member of the household. Uh, it went all-in because we provided uh, the an environment that allow the puppy to go all in, right? We gave the puppy what it needed to do that. Now, humans um, aren't so different from the puppy, okay? Uh, humans, you know, we all have the same things that we want. Uh, the list that's in everyone's head, we want somebody who's trustworthy, someone who's principled, courageous, competent, loyal, kind, understanding, forgiving, unselfish, right? So it's, it's no mystery what all humans are looking for in their relationships with other people. And this is really this, the 20, 22 second course in leadership. Take all of these things that, that is obvious that everyone is looking for and be the list, right? Be the list for everyone that you interact with in your life. And you do that, everybody's going all in, right? I mean, they're, you're not going to be able to keep them away. They are going to go all in. They're going to be willing to die for you, right? So th there's no mystery here. 
but it does take longer than seven days. W with the puppy, it takes seven days. With humans, it takes about six months, right? For, for the people in your life to poke and prod, really test you to see that you're for real uh, as you're being all of these things that, that they're looking for. Okay, it takes six months um, to really get humans to go all in. Uh, you know, and you might think, wow, that's a long time. Well, compared to what? Right? Look at what everybody else is doing. It doesn't work. Right? So, um, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious what, what, the, what the rational course of action is there. Right? Be the list. Um, you know, most people spend all day trying to get other people to like them. Right? They do it wrong. They, they focus on themselves. Right? What do I want? Um, but be, be who they want. Right? Deserve. Charlie Munger talks about this a lot. If you want a great marriage, deserve a great marriage. Right? Be the kind of person who deserves that thing that you want. Um, So, you know, it's, it's pretty straightforward. And there's a, there's a big, there's, uh, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll go this one step further. Okay, we're about halfway through now, but I'm going to take this one step further. What prevents people from acting this way, right? Going positive, going first, being the person on the elevator who smiles and says good morning. Okay, there's a very big obstacle here. Um, the obstacle is we're afraid of looking like a fool, right? We're afraid going positive, going first, and being told to screw off, right? Uh, lose face, look like a fool, right? Nobody wants to feel that way. Uh, but it's, it's a little strange, right? There's a 98% chance that we're going to have this positive interaction, right? And a 2% chance that they're going to say, ah, screw off, right? Um, th but there's a quirk with humans, and Daniel Kahneman figured it out. Uh, and the quirk with humans is that there's asymmetry, right? We have a fear of loss that's uh, more intense than um, the, the reward of gains uh, in this dynamic of going positive and going first. We fear losing about two times as much as we derive pleasure from the gain, okay? So, you know, and if you look at Peter Kaufman's numbers, we're giving up 98% to, to save on that 2% chance that, that we feel like a fool, right? So it's very asymmetric uh, reasons that people don't go positive, go first. Uh, initiate this mirrored reciprocation that's going to come back exactly how we put it out the vast majority of the time. So uh, it's, it's an incredibly powerful thing. There, there's a quote. Um, Lou Brock, right, set the major league record for stolen bases. He says, show me a man who's afraid of appearing foolish, and I'll show you a man you can beat every time. Okay? And it makes a lot of sense, right? People don't do it. They don't take that risk because they're so fearful of being made to look like a fool, right? Uh, and it's, you know, Bono. Peter Coffin points to Bono as someone who figured this out. You know, Bono has different numbers. He's got 90%, 10% chance. And Bono said, you know, I know 10% of the people are going to screw me, right? I'm going to be vulnerable 10% of the people are going to take advantage of me. But if I'm not willing to be vulnerable with that 10%, I'm going to miss out on the 90%. And, you know, that's why Bono has had such a great life. And he figured that out. Uh, and he was willing to take that chance, knowing the asymmetry is vastly skewed towards the upside. But people are so focused on the downside, right? That, that risk, that fear, that you know, 10% chance, 2% chance of losing face. So 
it's such an important lesson, guys. So I'm going to leave it there for now. And uh, I will make a part two of this. But let me know if you guys enjoyed this. Listen to this talk, okay? And don't just listen to it once. Uh, because I swear, each time I've listened to this, I've picked up new things that I didn't hear the first time. Um, so listen to it while you're driving. Listen to it while you're, you know, running errands. Uh, it is an incredibly powerful talk. The only talk I've been able to find from Peter Kaufman. And I guess he's done three talks at Google, at least as of the date when he put this talk out in 2018. And I'm really bummed that, you know, there's not more that's public uh, in terms of talks that Peter Kaufman has given. Because uh, it's, it's such a treasure trove of wisdom um, for making better decisions in life, uh, really for, for leading a happier life, more productive life. So I'll leave you with that, guys. Uh, and I will leave a link in the description to this talk. Um, but I just wanted to share. This is such a great resource um, for you to really savor Right? Don't just listen to it once and gloss over it. Really try to digest uh, the lessons in here. So uh, look for part two of this soon. Thanks for watching, and I will see you all in the next one. Take care.